Hello, welcome to Bibliophiles, the show on AADL TV, where we take a few moments in each episode to discuss one book topic, where each of us choose a different book, and we don't tell each other ahead of time. So that's a bit of fun for us. Uh, my name is Amanda, and I'm joined, as always, by Christopher and Lucy. And this week, or in this episode, we are discussing summer reads, whatever that might mean to you, summer reads. So, Christopher, what summer read did you bring to share today? Well, I thought for quite a while what a summer read is, and I thought maybe it's like a beach read. I thought it's probably not Dostoevsky or nonfiction, so I really thought to look for something that kind of fit the summary feeling, and I landed on 48 Clues into the Disappearance of My Sister by Joyce Carol Oates. I have never read her before. She has almost 60 books out, which is amazing. And I thought it's it's time to finally uh, give her a try. This book was wonderful. It tells the story of a sister who has gone missing a long time ago in 1991. And the whole book is laid out chapter by chapter with an individual clue into her disappearance so the clues are very kind of amorphous sometimes sometimes they're physical objects sometimes they're just a memory or a feeling or an emotion and the entire book is told from the perspective of the younger sister georgine the sister who has gone missing is marguerite the reason this book works so well for me is it feels very much like Talented Mr. Ripley by Patricia Highsmith or possibly like Annie Wilkes from Misery. The younger sister kind of admires, loves, and hates her older sister, the one who has gone missing. She goes back and forth between delusions, rage, jealousy and even moral judgment and it's really a fascinating relationship between the two sisters some readers are frustrated at the end of the book because i'll tell you there is no clear resolution as to what happened to the sister there are a possible number of suspects including georgine the younger sister but also, it's possible that the Wolf Lake killer has also killed Marguerite. So people are frustrated, but I decided that really wasn't even the main point of the book at all, to find out you know, who really did it. It was really this relationship and this window into the younger sister's mind and all of her thoughts and the way Joyce Carol Oates reveals these things in su in succession. So it was a lot of fun, really, really got into it, and it really gets in your head too. So that is 48 Clues into the Disappearance of My Sister by Joyce Carol Oates. Lucy, what did you read this time? Um, well, I also thought a lot about what a summer read means. And one thing that I always try to do, less so as I've gotten older and busier, is read like one big book every summer. And on my summer list repeatedly has been Moby Dick. And I tried reading it. I'm not going to talk about Moby Dick today. Don't worry. Just a little setup. But um, I try reading it and I've gotten like 150 pages in. I get bogged down in these descriptions of whales. And um, I just kind of thought I'd put it aside I feel like recently so many authors that I admire across genre, um, across age, across, you know, um, ethnicity, sexual identity, all of so many of them have referred to Moby Dick as something that influences them. So I thought I really do want to read this. But instead, I happened upon this book called Wild and Distant Seas. And this came out in January. It's by um, Tara, Car Tara Carr Roberts, and it's her first novel. And she took a character from the beginning of Moby Dick, Evangeline Hussey, who is this woman who owns um, the, the inn that everyone goes to. She makes chowder. She's kind of a comedic character in Moby Dick. And 
she's one of two women, I think, in the entire book that actually have speaking lines. Um, so she took Evangeline Hussey and she thought, what if I'm telling, what if Ishmael got her story wrong and I'm telling it differently? So that was her starting point. And from there, she went on to describe this woman who um, like owns this chowder house and this inn and Ishmael walks in there. And so this sets off um, sort of a, you know, it sets off a story that ends up affecting like generations of hers to come. So the story starts with Evangeline and then we get Evangeline's daughter, Rachel, and then we go to Rachel's daughter, Mara, and then finally to Annie. And this book takes us from Nantucket, which is where it starts, which is another reason I thought it was a good summer read because I um, lived in Nantucket one summer and it's a very summer community and um, starts in Nantucket, goes to Boston, goes to London, then to Brazil, then to Florence, I think, and then to Idaho. Um, so like all over the place through these four generations of, of women. And each of the women have a, um, a sort of special gift. It's like a, a remarkable sense of perception, almost like a sixth sense. And it kind of mutates and changes throughout them. So what it, the way it manifests with Evangeline is that she can see people's recent memories. So it's kind of like she's seeing what's currently happening, but somewhere else and then gently manipulate them. So she has manipulated the entire community into thinking that her husband is still alive, Mr. Hussey, though he has died at sea. And this allows her to just keep functioning as like an innkeeper. And um, her daughter, Rachel, sort of has that same ability, but heightened. So um, she can manipulate she can tell people what they ha have remembered or forgotten and she can manipulate that so she can change it as she would like. Um, so it's much more powerful and she uses that in really interesting ways. And then her daughter, Mara sees people's memories. Like if she put, you know, their, um, she puts her hand on them and she can remember things that happened to them, whether or not she wants to, or they want to. And she doesn't, she remembers everything that ever happened to her. And then her daughter uh, Annie has this ability to sort of like see where things have happened so she can like map things back in her head. It's really interesting. And it's the same, same idea, this memory, this perception, the sense of place, but it's sort of mutated down throughout. So I listened to a podcast with the author and she said um, she wanted to include some sort of like magical realism because she loves it. And she feels like it does exist in Moby Dick and she kind of likes weird books. And um, that was one of the really interesting parts. What I also loved about this book is it's essentially four books, because when you finish with one woman, you start with another and they're all over the world. These are very different women. So for a first novel to essentially like create these four books in four places and um, she's her craft is really strong and her descriptions like you the, the, of the place of what they're eating, what they're smelling, um, what they're wearing. It's all, it's all just really well written. And um, the longer I sit with this book, the more I kind of love it. And um, did it make me want to read Moby Dick? I don't know, but I feel like um, I got a summer reads version. Not that this is like a, you know, beach read or whatever, but a summer reads version of Moby Dick. So that is Wild and Distant Seas by Tara Carr Roberts. Amanda, what did you pick? Well, that sounds like, that sounds like a lot, Lucy. Um, also, Christopher, that book sounds good. And the summer, one of my versions of what a summer read is, is I love reading um, a breezy thriller, especially a teen thriller set in the summer, maybe at like a sleepaway camp or there's like a murder or so that sounds right of like a Natasha Preston kind of vibe. So I like that. Um, I also pondered what to bring for a summer. For me, a summer read is something you would want to read on a beach or is set in the summer or set on a lake or where there are summer vibes happening. So I have a couple of books, but only one I'm going to talk a lot of, or more about. Um, and that is the book Sag Harbor by Colson Whitehead. And he's a popular author. His books are fabulous. But this one is Sag Harbor. It was published in 2009. And it's a coming of age story. And it is set 
in or the place where it is summer is 1985, which already had me sold. Um, so it's set in 85 and there's a 15 year old boy named Benji and Benji, he is one of the only black students at an elite prep school in Manhattan. Um, his mom and dad are a doctor and a lawyer. Then he also has a younger brother, Reggie, who's a couple years younger than him. I think he's 12. I don't think he's 13 yet. Um, and Benji, he's not the most popular kid at school. He plays Dungeons and Dragons. He's into horror. He's skinny. He's anxious. Um, he's very self-aware. And so in the summer, it's fabulous because he he can escape that. His escape is going with his family. They've had this house there forever. Um, he escapes along with his family to Sag Harbor on Long Island. Um, there's a community of, it's a small community of like black professionals who have made this, this area their own. So they just go there every summer. It's a whole vibe. So Benji kind of ponders that he's going to like this black community that they've built up for themselves. And then he is like one of the only black kids in this white community, which is school. So it's kind of a release and like refreshing change of pace for him in the summer. Um, but it's summer, it, they're in Sag Harbor. And what's cool is um, Benji and Reggie's parents are, they only come out on the weekends. So they're on their own during the week, which is great because they're biking around. Um, they're they're taught, there's so much like 80s, like pop culture, and like songs and TV reference, like some fashion things. Um, they get into like girls and like part-time jobs. I think one works at a Burger King. Um, there's like ice cream, but there's lots of beach vibes where they're biking around to the beach. So you can just smell that the sea salt from the ocean and you can just pick up those vibes. And I, and for me, I love that. That's for me, that's a quintessential summer where like you're in summer reading it, but then you're also like in summer in another setting, enjoying somebody else's summer along with yours. Um, that's what I like about it. So, and this summer as Ben is 15, um, he's got high hopes for like becoming a new or becoming cool or just figuring it all out, but he still has a lot to ponder and think about like with his family and the community. Um, it's really, for me, it was funny. It was hilarious. I love a coming of age story and it was cool to get this glimpse into like Sag Harbor, like the Long Island beach community and hang out with um, his brothers. And I love of the brother camaraderie to the older brother, younger brother, you know, the younger brother wants to tag along with the older one, but he wants to be with his 16 year old friends and be cool. Then you got this young brother tagging along, you know, I'll stick your ice cream or whatever. Um, so I like that dynamic as well. So yeah, I, I loved it. And if you have read any of, um, Colson Whitehead's other books, um, his writing is phenomenal and it, it does so here too, even though it's a 2009 one. So I do recommend Sag Harbor by Colson Whitehead. Um, I also realized that my number one book I want to recommend to people for summer this year is Jaws by Peter Benchley. So even if you've seen the movie a hundred times and are curious, I just read it for the first time over winter. I loved it so much and I want to reread it this summer already while sitting on a beach on the water. I think that would be so fun. Um, I also highly recommend the book Joyland by Stephen King. If you want to read one of Stephen King's books, um, but this one's short and it's not very scary. There is a ghost in it, but it's set in the seventies and it's on a seaside carnival and the main character is 21 and he has a job there and there's a ghost. So it's a, again, a coming of age tale, but you feel the summer carnival vibes and it's so awesome because you feel like you're in a summer carnival. I do recommend that one. And then my quick third one or fourth one is, um, bad summer people by Emma Rosenblum. And I don't usually read these kinds of books or her novels, um, but you've got a bunch of like narcissistic rich people who are on their summer house and a dead body appears. So there's a bit of a mystery. So you've got this drama unfolding around this dead body um, in the middle of all the usual gossip and like the love affairs and stuff. So it's not my usual style, but I know it is a lot of other people's styles. So that's another one. And I think the author Emma Rosenblum has a new book that came out recently. Um, so yeah, bad summer people. So those are all of my books. I could tell you more, but I will stop so what do you guys think summer reads are you in you out you love summer reads yep all right christopher oh yeah uh really excited <laughs> to uh get through some of the books that are piled up all over the house <laughs> awesome all right well that is our episode of bibliophiles for this time if you have any beach reads or summer reads you would like to recommend to us please drop a comment below we would love to hear from you or if you want to recommend or discuss any other books, let us know. Obviously, we like talking about books and recommending them to each other and to our listeners out there. 
So thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you next time.